Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Pediatric Grand Rounds. Um, today we have Dr. Nicholas Tallman, one of our third year uh, soon to be graduating residents uh, as our speaker. Uh, Dr. Tallman is a graduate of Clemson University and the Edward Via Osteopathic School of Medicine. He has uh, been an absolutely outstanding resident in his time here at Carillion and will soon be taking his talents uh, to Mount Airy, North Carolina for a practice in outpatient pediatrics. Please join me in welcome Dr. Nicholas Tallman. Yeah. Hey, hey everyone. Uh, th thank you, Dr. Parmeshwar, and welcome to the Grand Rounds on this soggy Thursday in a really wet week. Um, I'm going to be doing my Grand Rounds on pediatric germ cell tumors. Um, my mentor for this is Dr. Atkinson, but Fortunately, she's not able to be here today, so I believe Dr. Edwards will be in her place. Um, neither Dr. Edwards, Atkinson, or I have any financial numbers to let you know of. As far as objectives for this lecture, we'll talk about some of the embryology, epidemiology of germ cell tumors, summarizing some of the origins and um, uh, tumors themselves. And we'll talk about common presentations and treatments and how you diagnose germ cell tumor. So, for, uh, for this topic, why, why am I doing this topic? Um, it, this kind of sent, this stems from recent personal experience. Um, starting a couple months ago, um, I started, I did have a little bit of groin discomfort and I thought it was really nothing. Went to my PP and asked if I can just get an ultrasound to rule out any, uh, something, thinking it was, this was probably really nothing. And come to find out the ultrasound was grossly abnormal. Um, I saw a urologist the next day, got uh, tumor markers drawn, and was in surgery by that next evening. Um, the pathology came back, and it was a mixed germ cell tumor um, with elevated alpha feta protein, elevated beta HUG to the level that he told me I looked at, or that I was five weeks pregnant. Um, CT scans showed that it was a stage two testicular cancer, um, and I've just recently completed three rounds of uh, chemotherapy, and now I have negative markers, so that's good. Um, but throughout all this, I was talking with my oncologist and trying to figure out uh, what I would do for a topic for my grand round. I said, Nick, this is easy. You've got to talk about germ cell tumor in kids so that you can uh, be able to share your story with a kid one day and share your knowledge with those parents. So. That brings me to my topic. So, pediatric germ cell tumors, though not very common, they do represent about 3% of all childhood cancers. Um, tumor markers such as alpha feta protein and beta HCG um, are good for early detectors of disease in some of the tumor types. Overall, the introduction of chemotherapy with um, is chemotherapy with cisplatin and then atopicide and bleomycin have improved. Um, survival and outcomes for kids uh, with germ cell tumors. So a little bit about embryology. I know this any of, the, any of this harkens back to days of medical school, but um, germ cells, um, primordial germ cells, uh, and the primordial, primordial germ cells originate in the extra embryonic location near the allantois of the yolk sac in the fourth fetal week. They migrate along the dorsal mesentery to the genital ridge, arriving at the gonads around the sixth week of fetal life. And so uh, the body needs proper primordial germ cell migration uh, for survival of the germ cells and formation of the gonads. And any arrested migration or um, migration can lead to germ cell deposition in non-gonadal sites. Cells in kids can be divided uh, at the most basic level between gonadal and extra gonadal. Um, you can also be further classified in by histology. Teratomas, those are mature versus immature teratomas, and then which are and then malignant germ cell tumors such as seminoma, which is in the testes, the just disc germinomas in the ovaries, and the germinomas in the brain, which we won't talk about today. Um, and then non seminomas such as yolk sac tumors, choreal carcinomas, embryonal uh, carcinomas, 
and then the mixed bag of any any of those together can be a mixed germ cell tumor, which is what I had. So the different cell types, um, just a little bit more about those. So the teratomas, those are composed of multiple embryonic layers. The mature uh, had, or benign contain several uh, cell in hair, teeth, thyroid, and gastric um, contents. You, we all remember seeing a picture of this in medical school or maybe in the anatomy lab of a teratoma with the hair there. For me, this was the first thing I saw when uh, cutting open um, a cadaver and looking at, when we looked at the ovaries, we found a nice teratoma here in medical school. Um, teratomas can also be immature, which are not as well differentiated as mature. And then dysgerminomas such as, and seminomas, those result uh, from abnormal premiotic differentiation um, during term cell development, and then choroidal carcinomas, embryonal, and yolk sac tumors are from abnormal postmeiotic extraembryonic differentiation. Uh, overall, teratomas are the most prevalent benign tumors of the gonads in kids, while the yolk sac tumors are the most prevalent malignant tumors of the gonads in children. Here's a little bit about the histology itself. The germinoma, which is at the top left, the A, um, you might see if you're looking under the microscope and knew what you're looking for, would see large tumor cells with clear cytoplasm, big nucleoli, um, sites, and then B, uh, embryonal uh, carcinomas, you can see poorly differentiated pleomorphic cells and again, larger nucleoli. C over here is the yolk sac tumor, so intracellular eosinophilic globules, like here in the middle. D is the choroidal carcinoma with syncytial tripoblast and cytotripoblast seen on uh, the slide. And then mature teratoma, cysts lined with squamous material, sebaceous glands, and then you might get the hair follicles. You see. Tumors and their location, uh, the, the histology, uh, such as in common places, such as the mature teratoma, often found in the mediastinum or the gonads or the sacrococcyx. Yolk sac uh, might see it again in the sacrococcyx area and the gonads. Embryonal um, carcinomas are almost exclusively in the testes, or carcinomas or in the mediastinum or the ovaries. And then the mixed germ cells can be anywhere. This slide is just more to, to show um, kind of the different locations of germ cell tumors um, in that uh, childhood extragonadal germ cell tumors arise somewhere in the midline, either the head and neck, the sacrococcyx area, the mediastinum, uh, or retroperitoneal area. Line location may represent the atypical embryonic migration of the primordial germ cells like we we're talking about. So epidemiology of germ cell tumors, um, annual incidence is, is low, about 0.5 per 100,000 um, in children under age of 15, or as one study said, about 900 new uh, cases per year in the U.S. Um, overall. And children under age 15, uh, that counts about 3 to 5 percent of all childhood cancers, but over the age of 15, the germ cell tumors account for about 15% of cancers. Um, germ cell tumors are the most common solid tumor and the most common malignancy after Hodgkin's lymphoma in this later teen age group, so 15 to 9 year, 19 years old. So not something that uh, should be overlooked. Other um, about the incidence of germ cell tumors by age and sex. Zero to four age range um, and the 15 to 19 year old range, there is a um, sort of a spike in and of germ cell tumors. And this is based off of the SEER data um, from the late uh, 80s to through the 90s and early 2000s. Those, those peaks there. Um, there also seems to be uh, incidence rates vary by race as well. And that uh, non-white non -white boys have a higher rate of germ cell tumors under the age of 10 when compared to their white counterparts. But after the age of 10, uh, African-American boys seem to have lower rates than white males in germ cell tumors. Uh, 
Another slide here showing, uh, just depicting another way to show the incidents there, um, that there seems to be a spike in incidents um, from the early toddler years, um, and then again in the mid to late teenage years with the non-gonadal germ cell tumors earlier on, um, and then gonadal, such as the ovarian and testicular germ cell tumors later on in the teenage years. So typically, germ cell tumors are caused by sporadic genetic mutations, but there are some cases that increase your risk of getting germ cell tumors, sex chromosomal abnormalities, 30% of those with gonadal dysgenesis uh, and 10% with undervirilization syndromes have an increased risk of germ cell tumors. Einfelter syndrome, uh, those with Y have an increased risk of metastinal germ cell tumors when compared to the general public. Um, those with Turner syndrome, syndrome have an increased risk of ovarian germ cell tumors. And uh, those with Down syndrome have an increased risk of germ cell tumors when compared to all other solid tumors of childhood. Um, if a little boy has crypt organism, it's associated with a uh, nine to, or three to nine uh, fold increased risk of a germ cell tumor. Um, so early orchopexy and boys that have crypt organism can lower the incidence of developing testicular cancer later on. With germ cell tumors, um, markers are of great importance. Um, the most common and most frequently ordered are the alpha fetal protein and the beta HCG. Um, these can aid in um, diagnosis preoperatively. Um, you can monitor response after um, surgery or and or chemotherapy, and uh, you can help, help detect um, later on. The alpha fetal protein is a glycoprotein synthesized in the fetal and yolk sac. Um, it can be increased um, in yolk sac tumors in embryonal carcinoma as well as mixed germ cell tumors. Um, but it's not the only thing, uh, um, or germ cell tumors are not the only thing that have an increased risk or increase in alpha fetal protein. You might see that increase in hepatoblastomas, hypothyroidism, cystic fibrosis, AIDS, hepatomas, and um, AFP is elevated in um, almost all infants at birth because of AFP is made by the fetal liver, and that levels, those levels drop off around the age of two. So they stay high for the first two of life in all children. Beta HCG um, is a peptide hormone that we know is um, elevated in pregnancy, typically, um, and but it can be elevated in those with choriocarcinomas. Again, embryonal carcinomas and germ cell tumors. Um, so keep that in mind. Um, and LDH, though, is used in adults um, with testicular cancer. Um, it has not been shown to have any prognostic significance in any pediatric patients. So typically, the only two markers we draw are AFP and beta HCG for the pediatric population if there's concern for germ cell tumor. So germ cell tumors overall, um, extra gonadal location accounts for about 54% of germ cell tumors. Um, the gonadal tumors typically present after puberty, um, as we saw in those incidental graphs um, earlier. The sacrococcygeal tumors um, present at birth or develop sometime in the first couple of years of life. The sinal tumors um, bear in MSC and again, kind of peak after puberty. And Though not common to have metastasis um, for germ cell tumors, if there is, it's typically to the lungs. Now about uh, different presentations of germ cell tumors by their location. Um, so we'll go over several of these of the most common areas. The first one would be testicular germ cell tumors. Um, incident, incidence of this is about um, five, 5.4 per 100,000 males per year. Uh, cancer represents about 10% represents about of all pediatric germ cell tumors, but of all the germ cell tumors that are malignant, it's about 30. There seems to be, again, a bimodal peak at around three years of age, and then again in later adolescence. If it is a malignant tumor, um, which is about 60% of the germ cell tumors, 
um, testicular germ cell tumors. Um, the yolk sac tumors are more typical in the younger boys, so those uh, would have the elevation of AFP. Um, and then seminomas, embryonal, and mixed uh, germ cell tumors are more common in adolescents and the young uh, adults. The typical presentation um, is a painless swelling of the scrotum or just testicular enlargement. If there is pain, it might be because of hemorrhage or necrosis um, that occurred and that can cause the pain. Or if they're spread to the retroperitoneal lymph nodes, it might cause some dull back pain as well. If you're seeing these kids in your office and there's concern um, on exam, there might be irregularly shaped um, testes with a fur mass within, uh, but not separate from the testes. And if you wanted to transluminate, um, you wouldn't be able to transluminate the mass. This on the left here um, is a PSA put out by a health department, um, I believe in Colorado, that just lets men know what some of the signs are that we talked about. So some discomfort in the testicles, maybe a dull ache, maybe some back pain. Um, and then rise to remind us that it's more and rather than separate for workup. Um, typically, the first thing to do is get an ultrasound, like in my case, um, to make sure that you're what you're looking at. If it is a potential tumor, you, you will draw um, tumor markers. So generally the AFP and the beta HUG. Um, and then management is typically the next step is orchiectomy. Typically because in pre boys, um, if they have a normal AFP, um, there is studies now that show that testy sparing surgery um, is, uh, is the way to go for these guys um, as it's likely a teratoma um, versus, a, versus a yolk sac tumor. So generally just a testy sparing surgery is okay. But if they've, after puberty, all testicular germ cell tumors um, a suspicion of those uh, radical inguinal um, orchiectomy is necessary. You get the histology and look at the, what type it is. Um, you'll get CT imaging of the pelvis, the abdomen, the chest to evaluate to see if there's any extra gonadal involvement. Um, for a lot of these boys, talking to them about um, sperm banking or to their parents about sperm banking um, prior to chemotherapy is um, a necessary conversation um, because you want to there's a chance that fertility might not be preserved. So sperm banking earlier is uh, recommended. And then the chemotherapy is typically gliomycin, topicide, cisplatin, um, given to all that have stage two to four disease, typically in three cycles. So then after those three cycles, the tumor burden is almost eliminated completely. And you should see a decrease in tumor markers by greater than 90%. Overall, the prognosis for testicular germ cell tumors is very favorable. Um, five to six year survival rates of nearly 100% for the stage one to three, and about 90% for those with stage four um, testicular cancer. So here is um, just some images. Uh, this one is of a through that had a testicle um, that they did uh, two markers that show that he had elevated AFP. Uh, histology showed this was a yolk sac tumor. He got he had orchiectomy, got chemotherapy, and his scan, and this is his first ultrasound. This is just another um, image to talk about um, the flow management for prepubertal testicular tumors. Um, just the importance of getting that serum AFP in the beginning, because if that's normal, um, you can do the testy sparing surgery is really what this whole chart boils down to. And um, the next part is talking about testicular screening, um, exam screening. So the United States Preventative Service Task Force recommends against testicular screening. Um, based on the low incidence and the favorable outcome of treatment, um, even in advanced disease. And there's a potential harm of false positive, the anxiety of false positive, and maybe some unnecessary tests. So recommendation is against screening for testicular cancer. 
the American Academy of Family Physicians, um, and the AAP and the American Cancer Society also all support this um, and don't recommend regular or routine screening for testicular exams. But each of them give a caveat that if the doctor wants to, they can do it um, and, or give the family information about screening, especially if the kid is at risk. With cancer, moving on to ovarian germ cell tumors. Ovarian, uh, the ovary is the most common site for germ cells after infancy. Germ cell tumors in the ovary account for about 30% of all germ cell tumors. And 70% of all neoplastic ovarian masses are um, ovarian germ cell tumors. Uh, luckily, about 80% of them are benign. Uh, they're almost always teratomas. And if after that, it would be dysgerminomas or yolk sac um, tumors. This image here is um, this is from a this is uterine fibroid with uh, a teratoma that um, was found actually when I went on a medical mission trip to Honduras. A, a teenage girl had this, um, and afterwards we got the histology back. But this is the gross image of the um, the tumor. The workup and Presentation. So typically um, there's abdominal pain, lower abdominal fullness or distension, or you might be able to feel the pelvic abdominal mass 80% of the cases. Um, less commonly, um, there might be acute abdomen because of see precocious puberty if there is production of the beta HCG by the tumor. Work up similar to cicular cancer, get an ultrasound. Um, one of the things that you might see. Um, might be calcifications if there's a teratoma, such as this ultrasound here, um, with hypochoic and hyperchoic areas. That's pretty classic for um, teratoma in the ovary. Getting pelvic CTs and tumor markers would be the next steps as well. And then surgery um, to get histology would be recommended as well um, to resect the tumor um, without sacrificing adjacent organs, um, and you want to evaluate the full extent of the um, disease. So looking at um, pelvic and retroperitoneal lymph nodes would be of importance as well. I put in there about karyotypes. Um, there is uh, um, some studies that say that you can consider getting karyotype um, for all girls with a prepubertal pelvic mass, because about 5% um, arise in those with genetic, or this genetic um, gonads, such as Swire syndrome, um, it's a consideration for getting a karyotype. Um, the next would be um, the sacrococcygeal germ cell tumors. The most common germ cell tumors in newborns and infants. Um, there seems to be a female to male predominance. Rare, um, cause about um, occurs about one in thirty-five thousand lives. And typically, there's two scenarios of this. It might be a large, predominantly external lesion um, that was either known prenatally or you can see it at birth, um, and it's even greater than ninety percent of the cases. Or you might see a less apparent pelvic tumor that pops up sometime between birth and four years old that is more likely to be malignant. Um, the presentation. Can, uh, can vary really just based on those scenarios. So if it um, develops in utero, um, you might get polyhebdramnios, shunting with a uh, high output cardiac failure, um, high drops or fetal dystocia. If you have any of these, consider um, the ex-utero intrapartum therapy or the exit procedure, especially if they have cardiac failure or high output cardiac failure or hemorrhage. So you do this um, sometime in the third trimester. Um, if this mommy goes into labor, um, recommended that uh, emergency C-section for that baby. In older infants, um, you might get presenting uh, symptoms of the lesion. So that can be constipation, pain when the little kid sits. You might have buttock asymmetry or a abdominal or buttock mass noted. And if you can see here on the right, this is the the tumor that might present at birth. Uh, pretty striking and huge and hard to miss that tumor when you see that in a little baby. Um, and it can be known prenatally. 
It was a doctor, Dr. Altman in the 1970s, who came up with a classification uh, system for the sacred coccygeal and germ cell tumors um, based on the degree, degree of internalization versus externalization. So this one is called an Altman type one um, in that it's entirely external. And then moving on to type four is an Altman type four, which is entire, entirely internal. How do you manage these? Um, well, you want to get uh, CT or MRI, um, or at the very least, ultrasound imaging to see the degree of the extension of the of pelvis and abdomen. Um, getting AFP levels would be helpful, but they might be elevated anyways in uh, kids at age of two. You have to take that in mind. Um, when you do, if you do surgery for these kids, the recommendation is remove the mass and include the removal of the coccyx to minimize any recurrence um, of the tumor. Observation and monitoring of AFP levels for every several months for the first um, few years of life is necessary because we want to measure or and look at recurrence of if it is a yolk sac tumor, which can occur in about 14 to 20 percent of cases. Um, if you're not able to get the whole tumor right away, or um, you might consider giving the child platinum-based chemotherapy and then try to um, surgery for getting the residual disease out. With all this, and despite how gruesome, uh, how large it is that you see at birth, the survival rate and, and prognosis is still great. Um, for all grades of these tumors, it's greater than 90%. But there are some sequela um, in these children um, that you have to tell parents about, um, such as functional impairment, um, might get neuropathic bladder or bowel abnormalities in about up to 40% of these kids. One study showed that 13% um, had very frequent soiling, um, 16 to 20% with constipation, and 30% with urinary um, control problems for the first couple of years of life. Next type of germ cell tumor is a mediastinal tumor. Um, that's about 5% of all germ cell tumors and accounts for about 12% of all mediastinal tumors in children. Uh, these are malignant. And if they are malignant, they are carry the worst prognosis of all germ cell tumors based on their location. When you look at them, um, they are located in the anterior mediastinum, um, which is one of the key facts of the mediastinal germ cell tumors. Symptoms for these children might be respiratory symptoms such as cough or wheezing, shortness of breath, um, might get chest pain or facial fullness, uh, congestion because of su su superior vena cable obstruction. So the workup for these um, children include an X-ray um, of the chest, um, and likely a chest CT as well. If you see calcifications, um, again, kind of like the ovarian germ cell tumors, um, consider a teratoma um, until proven otherwise for these children. Um, you generally do spontan-based chemotherapy to decrease bird tumor burden, and then you resect the tumor, um, and usually through a thoracotomy or a sternotomy for these kids. Like I said, if it is malignant, the overall survival rate is lower than all other germ cell tumors at about 71%. There is an image of mediastinal germ cell tumors. This one is a left-sided mediastinal germ cell tumor in a 13-year-old guy with mixed germ cell tumor. You can see this in, uh, great tumor burden here in the left chest. The next um, type is a retroperitoneal germ cell tumor. These are, are, account for about 4% of all germ cell tumors. Um, most of them occur um, before the age of one, and three quarters of them, the kid is um, in kindergarten. Thankfully, most of them are benign and are teratomas. Um, the symptoms of these, if the kids can tell you, are to be um, abdominal or back pain, you might be able to feel abdominal mass in the retroperitoneal area. Um, work up, like all the other ones, start with usually with imaging, usually with ultrasound maybe some x-rays or CT. Um, you wanna get those uh, to evaluate the kidneys and adrenals to different from like a Will's tumor, tumor or a neuroblastoma. And again, um, you'll get biopsy um, to look at the histology for these as well. Management with this is um, surgery coupled with um, chemotherapy, especially if it's malignant, these kids. 
And here is a, another scan um, showing a retroperitoneal germ cell tumor. This one is a two-year-old little guy um, that has a retroperitoneal mass, as you can see with calcifications and um, some components here. And then you see the um, anterior displacement of the aorta, letting you know that we're in the retroperitoneal. We've talked about the different types of germ cell tumors. One of the next things is talking about staging. So this is a table that's quite large, but to show about um, staging of germ cell tumors using um, lab markers and imaging like CTs and MRIs beforehand. Um, this helps stratification and treatment protocols the patient may be placed into. I highlighted here um, in red testicular, which is a similar way to talk about um, ovarian as well and extragonadal. So um, the children's oncology group came up with this protocol. Stage one is typically limited to the primary site. Um, they have normal tumor markers, and generally you can get away with just surgery without chemotherapy. Um, stage two have increased markers, low spread to um, lymph nodes around there, but size of that lymph node is um, less than two centimeters. Um, stage three would be again increased tumor markers, but a little bit larger tumor uh, local lymph nodes greater than two centimeters would be seen. And then if there's any distance metas distant metas metastasis, such as to the lungs or liver, it's going to be a stage four germ cell tumor. So once you know the staging, you can do a risk stratification. And again, the children's oncology group recently came up with this risk stratification system to have a better direct, uh, directed therapy. The low risk are those with that you can do alone um, and then follow that with active surveillance. So those are all stage one testicular, extragonadal, and ovarian germ cell tumors. Intermediate risk are those that do require chemotherapy but have good outcomes typically. And those are standard risk one um, based on age. So less than 11, it's all stage two through four testicular, ovarian, and extragonadal germ cell tumors. Standard risk two is those are. Um, if they're over 11 or 11, um, it's different uh, categories. So that's stage two to four testicular cancer again, but only stage two to three ovarian and stage two extragonadal germ cell tumors. The high risk are those that uh, with less fair outcomes, um, and those are stage three through four extragonadal um, germ cell tumors, regardless of age. And then uh, little girls greater than 11. Um, with stage four ovarian germ cell tumors. The prognostic factors um, at diagnosis kind of well the kid will do. Um, so age, young versus um, older children. Typically, the younger children do better overall um, with germ cell tumors. And um, the stage of disease at diagnosis is important. With a higher disease, um, stage of disease indicating worse. Primary site is the disease um, also affects prognosis in that um, the malignant metastinal has the worst prognosis overall, like we talked about. Tumor markers, if they decline, so the AFP, beta HCG decline over time in response to therapy, that's a good sign. Um, the histology plays a factor in that teratoma is generally more favorable than the other um, histology types. And then if there's any presence of gonadal dysgenesis, um, those typically carry worse prognosis overall for these children. And then I'll go over just some uh, treatment uh, treatment for these kids. So surgery and observation, we talked about that um, a little bit. So patients with completely resected immature teratomas, regardless of a or regardless of location or grade of that tumor, um, you can do the surgery and observation. Um, those with stage one, Seminomonas and non seminomonas germ cell tumors, um, you can do surgery enough. In this watch and wait approach after surgery, you need to have the child follow up closely with their oncologist for um, exams, um, mark, uh, following the tumor markers, and then uh, doing regular tumor marker imaging of the primary site, uh, to, tumor imaging of the primary site um, for months to years afterwards to measure against any type of recurrence. If there is chemotherapy, um, 
uh, then the patients typically get a cisplatin based um, or based chemotherapy. But before modern chemotherapy was available, um, children with germ cell tumors um, have your survival rate of kind of abysmal uh, 15 to 20 surgery and radiation therapy offered at that time. Uh, guy up here in the corner, his name is Dr. Larry Einhorn. Um, I'm grateful for him in that uh, he trialed uh, in 1977 um, cisplatin for germ cell tumors, um, in particular testicular cancer. And that was the first study to show um, you could cure a solid tumor um, with chemotherapy alone. And since that time, his treatment pr protocol he made um, has been mimicked um, by for all the different types of germs for adults and pediatrics. So we, we should be thankful for Dr. Einhorn. Um, see an increase of survival for these kids. Now, for all germ cell tumors um, combined, the five-year survival, five survival is greater than 85%. This uh, is to show uh, the different um, chemotherapy schedules for um, children and uh, adults with germ cell tumors that get chemo. Um, so the regimen is leomycin, etoposide, and splatin, unless you're in England, they use carboplatin. And, um, it's typically three cycles, 21 days each. The adults, they do bleomycin once per week um, and throughout the whole uh, protocol. But in kids, they do uh, bleomycin only on the first day of each cycle. Um, so they only get it three times rather than the nine times. Um, and that's just due to fear of excessive lung toxicity in the developing uh, lungs of children. So with the bleomycin, but regimen, um, it is pretty aggressive, but it has great cure rates. The radiation therapy um, can be helpful in uh, testicular metastinal seminomas um, and ovarian dysterminomas, um, as they're sensitive to radiation, but um, Radiation therapy is rarely and cautiously recommended uh, because of the low, because of the known late side effects such as um, secondary malignancies for these kids. Here's another um, chart to really just kind of summarize the chemotherapy for all the different stages of for testicular and ovarian um, germ cell tumor children um, at each country. You look at it; they're basically very similar, um, in, but uh, using them in England versus Latin here. But overall, they have great outcomes and prognosis for the children treated with the chemotherapy. As with most childhood cancers, um, referring the child to a large medical center. Um, and multidisciplinary team uh, to treat the cancer um, often offers the best chance of cure and treatment. Um, so if you were to diagnose a child with, a child with this, then get them to a larger center would be most helpful. Here at those centers, they can, as we know, um, participate in clinical trials if there is in the open um, and help uh, the further um, advancement and knowledge of germ cell tumors in the future. For families, I found a couple of websites that um, were helpful and at a level um, that uh, I believe most parents and children can understand. One of them is through John Hopkins um, listed here. Um, one is through Children's National and another, another is through the National Cancer Society. So three potential websites that families can um, use as kind of a uh, springboard to look at information on germ cell tumors um, once they are diagnosed and find out about trials and treatments going forward. So as with any cancer, um, follow-up is greatly important. For those with um, elevated tumor markers at the beginning, um, monitoring the alpha fetal protein and the beta ACG levels. So we do that for monthly for the first six months um, because that's the highest risk of recurrence during that time. And then you measure it every three years um, for 
measuring those um, tumor markers. You'll get an MRI or a CT of the primary site after you complete um, chemotherapy. Um, and then afterwards, uh, you just get um, imaging of the primary site every three months for the first year, then every six months for the second year, and then you, then every year um, for a total of five years. During that whole time, you're also going to be getting chest x-rays annually as well, all this to um, measure and look for any recurrence or spread of um, the tumor. Um, and if the tumor markers are normal at diagnosis, imaging tests um, are done in the same frequency as um, above with every three months for the first two years and then annually for the next five. Um, one of the reasons you also do this to measure for and look out for the growing, what's called a growing teratoma syndrome. Um, in those with non seminomous germ cell tumors, you might see this. So it's a recurrent growing mass that appears during or after chemo, even in the presence of normal tumor markers. So um, something that oncologists are aware of, and that's why we do these um, follow-up scans. Side effects with any chemotherapy and any drug, there is potential for um, adverse effects. Germ cell tumors overall were not included in the childhood cancer survivor study, which was from the mid to late 1990s, um, which uh, looked at late effects of drugs. Um, therapies. Um, so the late effects are not as well studied for other childhood cancers. Um, and a lot of the late effects that we know of are based partly on uh, adult data. Um, we've known that cisplatin levels are measurable for years after treatment in the, it's likely stored in the bones and the plasma. Um, there's an increased risk of, uh, by two times, um, of cardiovascular disease, thinking that it might uh, lead to damage of the endothelial cells in the heart itself um, with chemotherapy. Um, there's a risk of second malignant neoplasms. Um, the toposide uh, increases the risk of secondary cancers such as AML. Leukemia may be seen in, in a small percentage of those with um, testicular cancer after treatment. Um, platinum chemotherapy uh, is associated with increased risk of nephrotoxicity and ototoxicity. So during uh, treatment, also following uh, um, renal panels um, is very important in um, regular asking of the doctor or the patient about their hearing, uh, important as well. Bleomycin, like we talked about, um, can cause lung fibrosis. So it's a known side effects and one of the reasons why uh, we frequently, um, our, our patients are asked about their breathing status um, and any respiratory symptoms uh, during treatment with the chemotherapy. And then in those with testicular cancer, there's a risk of decreased fertility and abnormal sperm count mobility after uh, chemotherapy. So the sperm banking prior to chemotherapy is important if it's important to the, the family to preserve their fertility for their son. And towards the end, uh, collaborations. Um, this was an exciting thing when I was looking at some of the information on germ cell tumors um, and that uh, often pediatric and adult, uh, especially as of all types, um, don't often collaborate on stuff, especially in some oncology um, sectors. But uh, back in 2009, um, there was a thing formed by the Children's Oncology Group in the U.S. in the Children's Cancer Center in the U.K. They formed what was called the Malignant Germ Cell Tumor International Consortium, or MAGIC, um, came together to uh, improve outcomes for all patients with germ cell tumors and to find out better ways for um, studying and decreasing toxicity of treatments. Um, now this includes more than 11 countries and 40 institutions around the world. Um, and the goal is to help standardize risk um, or standardize the staging, the risk stratification, and the treatment approaches for kids with germ cell tumors. Overall, since 2009, this group has produced over 30 articles and um, studies about germ cell tumors. Um, they helped uh, form the risk stratification that we talked about earlier with the low, the standard, and the poor risk groups. One of the things that was exciting that um, came out of this study was 
looking at microRNA um, for diagnosis of tumors. Um, there was a group led by Palmer in 2010 that showed that microRNAs um, can be shed by tumor cells and found in circulation um, in the serum, and that uh, the serum levels increase in patients with germ cell tumors at diagnosis, regardless of their age, histology, or location. So this could be helpful in those that don't have elevated typical tumor markers of the AFP or the beta HCG and be a way to track tumors, particularly in the future. But this needs more studying and more data, but it does look promising. And then there are two big studies um, listed here, two trials, the 1531 and the 1532. Um, so to see if we can eliminate uh, chemotherapy in stage one disease, like we've talked about earlier. And then this 1532 talks about it's a large study um, that included um, children um, up to age 11 or down to age 11 in an adult study about germ cell tumors um, in women. So in summary, uh, germ cell tumors are a rare um, tumor in childhood, counts for about 3% of childhood cancers on the age of 15, but more than uh, about 15% when they're greater than 15. Markers such as beta HCG uh, and AFP can be helpful um, in following the patients. Getting imaging such as uh, ultrasounds, X ray, MRI, or CTs help with staging and risk stratification. Um, knowing that modern chemotherapy with basically the platinum based chemotherapy with the atopicide and bleomycin have greatly improved in kids with germ cell tumors, and that there are groups that are coming together to study more and research more about germ cell tumors to help with future diagnosis and management. So we went on to a couple MLC questions. Um, shouldn't be too hard. Um, so I'll read the questions and give a little bit of time to answer. So the first one is a 16 year old adolescent male presents with a large firm um, or mass. Um, subsequent ultrasound confirms the presence of a solid mass, um, what should what is the most appropriate that Rachel has answered? Um, we'll see if anyone else can. All right, and Rachel is correct. Um, oh, and, and Kevin also said that. Um, so a so C is right. So measuring AFP and uh, beta HCG would be important. Um, Next step, and then after that, um, if those are um, admirable, likely get uh, orchiectomy for this kid as well. So good job, Rachel and Kevin. Next question: um, A seventeen-year-old female presents with three-month history of irregular menses, lower abdominal pain with heaviness. Physical exam reveals distended abdomen and a papal mass in their abdomen. As part of a workup, you get a plain X-ray which showed calcifications in the area of the left ovary. Long is often associated with her radiographic finding. Talked a little bit about calcifications earlier on. And Olivia and Rachel um, have answered, um, as well as I'm sure others, but I can't hear you yelling. Um, and the answer, yep, is B. Um, a mature cystic teratoma um, is one of the benign ovarian tumors. Um, the calcifications are common and help differentiate it from the other benign ovarian um, neoplasms, as we talked about. Good job. And then finally, an easier one um, what is the most common germinal tumor?
Answer is D. Yep. So sacred cockatiel ter uh, um, or teratomas are the most common in infancy. As we saw that uh, large mass uh, on that little baby that was born earlier. So I have for you guys. Uh, I don't know if there's any questions. Um, I don't know if I'll be able to answer. If if not, I can 